about 50 minutes for a closing discussion, the official topic of which is why is renormalization needed to address ultraviolet divergences? A question of the presupposition. Um, so maybe we can have each of today's speakers say something and then open up the floor. Um, why don't we go in the same order as we went today, start with Eduardo. Okay. I was hoping to be in the middle. Oh. No, it's all right. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it's interesting uh, because I didn't really talk uh, about anything related to UV divergences or randomization, but I, I can I can definitely give you my, my take on those things. Um, why? Uh, that's a question that you should ask physicists, I think, about because uh, I keep telling people that physics doesn't really answer why. That's philosophy, of course. Um, here's the thing. Uh, I think that is a good idea to distinguish two kinds of divergences, and uh, I'm not going to. UV or different kinds of divergences. One are divergences of the theory, which are divergences that are there in the theory, and if you use non-perturbative method with the theory, you're going to face them as well. And there's a second kind that are uh, divergences that appear within perturbation theory. Um, the second kind of, of, of divergences that appear within perturbation theory, that UV divergences uh, in this case, are strongly related with um, the fact that you have uh, integrals in time that are uh, the, you basically, you have something effective like a discontinuous switching function um, in the Lyson expansion, as we talked about, because you have like a triangular kind of integrals. Now, the, the UV divergences um, are oftentimes, when you consider stuff that, like the stuff I talked about this morning, when you consider quantum field theory in limited regions of space and time, and you consider, for example, the coupling of detectors or interactions that are restricted in space and time, you oftentimes don't face these kinds of divergences. And the reason is because you have a spatial smearing of the observables that you're coupling to other things. And because of that, um, those divergences, um, basically uh, effective calculations, you're going to end up with something like Fourier transforms of the spatial smearing. And if the spatial smearing is smooth enough, the Fourier transform will kill the UV. And will tell you that the UV is going to be more or less relevant to your physics depending on your spatial localization. Why do I say all this? I say all this to, to make the point that I believe that a lot, not all of it, but a lot of the UV divergences that appear in field theories are strongly related or rooted onto the, the particle physicist approach, the S-matrix approach, the let's do calculations that are not restricted to a finite domain. Point-like particles or point-like kind of interactions as well as uh, infinite time duration of interactions. These two things together conspire to give us a lot of UV divergences. And um, maybe the dependence on scale that we have here, it's more related to uh, space-time localizations of your physics, same as I was talked a little bit about, uh, paraphrasing Schwinger here, than it is to really something physical that requires normalization. Um, not how much, I think, the, how much time we have per person to talk now? Eight minutes. Oh, what, per person? Nah, yes, yes. Okay. <laughs> so the, the other thing that I would say, so I, I could stop here, because that's a point that is self-contained. There's another, there's another point that I think is worth making here, right? Uh, which is, I've been mentioned a little bit, but not much. What about infrared divergences? Infrared divergences are an amazing example of problems that happen with particle physics approaches to field theory. Infrared divergences are not there in the field theory. Infrared divergences are totally an artifact of how you do perturbation theory and an assumption about asymptotic states. So it, it, the, 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 the particle physicist approach that you have somehow uh, asymptotically free, so basically at inf a minus infinity plus infinity, somehow you're able to prepare uh, eigenstates if you want of the free theory and to measure in the eigenbasis at the end of the free theory introduces the problem of IR divergences. And there's a nice discussion in Weinberg's book, in the first book of Weinberg's The Quantum Theory of Fields about IR divergences, where he says, oh, look at that. IR divergences are there, but if you do a first order calculation and then a second order calculation, the first order square cancels the second order square calculations. And then he actually talked about the two schemes of renormalization or well, elimination of these IR divergences, which are blood Norsic, and the other one I forgot actually right now what the name is. Anyway, the other scheme. And they say, oh, these two are one of the, yes, there you go. One of them is better than the other because one of them is ignoring the disconnected diagrams and the other one is not. Uh, people working after that proved that those are just two different instances of resumming selectively the terms of a divergent series in the same way as you can do the series 
plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 minus 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 minus 1 up to infinity. That's a divergent series. But I can actually pick partial sums that are finite. I can cancel this term with this one and this one with this one and so on and so forth and give the illusion that that thing is finite. And that's the way people handle IR divergences in particle colliders and in particle physics. No, uh, the problem is that you're doing perturbation theory and bad assumptions about your asymptotic states. So I do have a belief, and there's the closing phrase, I guess. I have a belief that uh, many of those divergences are, uh, I think, goes in the philosophy of some of the talk that we heard here. If we actually do things right in terms of AQFT approaches and we talk about duration, spatial extension and duration of interactions and processes, kind of also the philosophy of Swinger here, maybe there's no need for these kind of UV divergences to show up and the need for renormalization per se as a particular thing that is fundamental. Anyway. Should I go? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so, yeah, I thought maybe I should say something about uh, why we've been doing history of renormalization theory since our, our three talks were all historical. Um, yeah, and I guess, like, the reason that I got interested in approaching things from a more historical point of view was that, um, yeah, I guess the, the philosophical kind of more explanatory questions about how renormalization works can kind of quite naturally be converted into historical problems, essentially. Um, so yeah, as, as Porter was saying, there's this kind of folk story in the, in the physics uh, community, this folk history of how renormalization theory developed uh, in which, yeah, when renormalization methods were introduced in the late 40s, they didn't really make any physical sense and they were, yeah, conceptually suspect in various ways and then nothing happened <laughs> for 20 years and then Kenneth Wilson came along and introduced the renormalization group and now everything makes sense. Um, yeah, and I'm really, in, yeah, I guess all three of our talks are kind of complicating that picture and saying, um, no, there, were, there, were lot, there was lots of other stuff going on in, in renormalization theory. Uh, in between those times, um, we then have the question of like how we integrate all of these different strands together and kind of, um, yeah, how, what were the what were the original problems with the with the original perturbative renormalization um, procedure, which have been solved by later, well, have they been solved by later developments, and which developments have solved which problems? And uh, yeah, so I think that's why approaching these things historically is. Is a, is a good way to go with, with these issues. Um, yeah, I've got other stuff I could say, but it's not really related that to that, so maybe I'll just, yeah, pass on to Mike, I guess. Yeah, so on this particular question, I've kind of laid out where I stand at the stage. I think um, what I hope to have accomplished today was to emphasize that what we mean by renormalization is, um, uh, dependent on how you articulate your formalism, um, I think I'd say that um, the way we um, initially articulated renormalization theory, um, in some sense, was uh, is a is a function of a number of contingent historical factors about the state of the mathematical expression of the theory at the time that that renormalization prescription was developed. Same goes for um, the way that we think about the renormalization group. Um, and so, yeah, I'm very sympathetic to um, what Eduardo said about um, being clear about um, uh, the ultraviolet divergences of perturbation theory. And what I've been talking about is precisely those. And um, uh, those are um, important because, in large measure, they're what um, constrained, or the, the, that's what people initially had in mind when they're developing renormalization techniques. Those are the um, divergences that they were confronting. Now we know that there's even um, broader classes of problems that we want to get information about if you want to give a complete structural characterization of, uh, of the theory. So um, it's really important to um, disambiguate those things. But um, beyond that, I don't think I have anything new to, uh, beyond what I've already said. Um, I mean, in the, I'm in the weird position of also thinking that, like, we kind of don't, uh, the, the, the presupposition in the question. Um, yeah, so, I mean, there's, there's, I mean, I basically agree with, uh, 
what's been said already that um, the appearance of divergences in perturbation theory is uh, it's yeah it's a symptom of um, multiplying uh, it's a symptom of, of not handling distribution valued objects appropriately um, I guess maybe what I will say is that um, in some sense UE divergences in perturbation theory are kind of uh, they're often people will sometimes talk about uh, a motivation for effective field theory is um, stemming from eliminating uh, UV divergences and perturbation theory. That that's why you work with an effective field theory. Um, doesn't like that's a nice feature, but uh, so you then hear the story, uh, and you actually kind of flag this on the slide, um, which is the oh, like if we just handle distributions correctly, then we don't need to do effective field theory at all. Um, and like, if all you care about is UV, UV divergences and perturbation theory, uh, then um, that's in some sense true, uh, assuming that the scaling story that I don't understand works. Um, but uh, that's like not the, so for one, um, on purely mathematical grounds, uh, many of these, like any theories that are not asymptotically free of land upholes, those are much more worrying uh, UV divergences. Um, so if you want to calculate the, how the coupling scales at uh, high energies, um, so in quantum electrodynamics, for example, it's perturbatively more normalizable. Um, you might think that means that you could, in principle, extend it to arbitrarily high energies. Um, it's, uh, if you handle the distributions correctly, the UV divergences don't show up in perturbation theory at all. Um, then you calculate the way that the coupling changes with energy scale, uh, and you find that it get it becomes infinite at some finite uh, and finite but high, um, like you know, hilariously high uh, energy scale, um, and that in some sense is a much more compelling uh, hmm. you know, sort of divergence <clears throat> that would lead you to treat a theory as effective than just the appearance of uh, divergence in perturbation theory. Hmm. Uh, I mean, there's a reason that um, the Clay Mathematics Institute suggested that you should spend your time trying to construct non-abelian gauge theories, uh, and it's not, you know, it's because they're asymptotically free in part. It's not because, mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, I mean, I guess maybe that's what I'll say is that uh, there's, um, like, if all you were concerned about is uh, diver UV divergence and perturbation theory, then, um, but yeah, you might think that. Why would we ever do effective field theory? Who cares? Um, but I mean, it's also the fact that uh, we think field theory breaks down the physical grounds um, when we have, when gravitational effects become important. And so, like those, in some ways, have always been the much more compelling arguments for effective field theory. So it's actually kind of nice to have this like be made very explicit. Clean uh, separation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's part of the power of this um, this precise methodology for understanding. Um, the deficiencies of perturbation theory as it's um, standardly developed. That's that's how I that's how I kind of think about the value of this um, formalism that I was describing. Can I can I ask a question? Yes. So I want to hear more about. Oh, oh wait, sorry. Have I? Yes. That's okay. Yeah. Okay. So I I, I want to hear more about um, uh, uh, this the, the idea that um, the, in the way we set up perturbation theory, we're kind of like, in, we're setting ourselves up to have problems in the IR, and, uh, and in particular, how, um, how how you think about this. Because sometimes you find um, uh, in these calculations that you can, you can induce these cancellation mechanisms, and then what you end up with is, at the end of the day, an expression that's perfectly finite, but then it has some detector resolution mm -hmm. in the in the expression. And so I'm wondering, given um, what you've told us about, okay. um, uh, what you've been thinking about more generally, how this kind of fits into your story. Right, so the, um, the, the, the textbook way of handling IR divergences is uh, the two schemes that I mentioned. Uh, uh, you can have one scheme where uh, you just go plainly and say, oh, in my second order diagrams, I have IR divergences. But if I consider, uh, this is, uh, I know that you know what I'm talking about, but it's just yeah, to make a framework. Yeah. If, if you consider uh, that you can have the same processes indistinguishable, like, okay, the soft structure of the theory, my detectors don't see. I'm going to have a high energy physics experiment here. And if, uh, say, electrons, right, scattering between electrons, that's enough. If you have also a soft photon coming out, 
as in like a very IR photon coming out, my detector won't see it. So following uh, Born's rule, I need to, to compute amplitudes of probability, I need to add up over all possible processes that can happen. And in particular, that's one of them. When I add that, that's the first, you say first order, I add a leg there of a photon I don't see. And then if I, uh, I include that extra thing that I didn't have at the beginning, if I add that extra thing, then in the, in the sum of all possible values of that subphoton below a scale, then I get um, a term that is also IR divergent. And it's IR divergent with the same kind of divergence as the second order one that I had in my theory to begin with. Therefore, when I add that, the two things cancel, and I'm left with a finite part that is related to this IR cutoff that you put in your theory. Now, people realize, well, that's a little bit sketchy because I could also have diagrams where I have a photon, if you want, so photons are propagating without interacting as well. And if I add those, I recover divergences again. And then people say, okay, no, no, fine, fine. But then what you need to do is also consider the second order version of that. In the second order, also the disconnected diagrams involving soft photons, you add as well. And adding that, you cancel again. Now, uh, that's what you will find in, 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 um, in um, Weinberg's book. Now, people have uh, do re done research uh, onto that. There is in, in, in Plymouth University, there are two people, um, Macmillan and Lavelle, that worked on this. Basically, they specialized in working on IR divergences. And they showed that um, and there are an infinite ways of actually including extra terms there that are sub-photon based uh, in first and second order that you can use to cancel things. And in fact, they make this analogy well, in a way that this series is, is what we are doing here. It's just adding up terms in my series that cancel selectively some other terms. And there's an ambiguity how to check it. And depending on how you do it, you get different prefactors in this logarithmic. It's always logarithmic, depends on the scale of the IR detector. But the prefactor is ambiguous. It depends on your scheme. So in a way, what they're doing here is something like, again, you have an infinite series. And that infinite series, um, uh, you are adding selectively some of the terms to make something finite. But then you can ask, OK, then. Uh, then what's the problem? Why do we have that imperturbation theory? And that was actually solved early on. And that was uh, solved by Fadeyev. Fadeyev uh, talks a about higher divergences and has a nice paper about it. There are several papers following up on that, uh, about um, why we have higher divergences. And the, reasons, the reason is that in, uh, you will have them in scattering theory when you assume that your initial states are eigenstates of the free theory and you find out that you make measurements in eigenstates of the free theory. Uh, uh, in particular, uh, Fadeyev shows that, well, the first thing he shows is that when you take the long time limiting or scattering process, so you, saw, you will hear this in a, in a first course in particle physics. I have plane wave kind of states coming in, and here they're free. When they get really close, like the two, because of the part, again, it's the particle philosophy, particle mentality that I think is harmful. You get two electrons that are far away, they don't see each other much, and then these two electrons get really close in the scattering area, at time around zero, if you want, time minus infinity, they're free. Then they get close and they see each other because they're close to each other at time zero around that. And then at time plus infinity, they, they, the outcome go, goes away as well. And we measure in the basis of those three things. Now, the problem with that is that it's not true that a, an electron alone, if you want, if you propagate some excitation of the fermion field, that thing is not free. Uh, it, it, some of the diagrams, if you want to go through it, if we're actually in your talk, right? You get an electron propagator, right, like that. And then you get higher order corrections of, uh, if you want, uh, photon loops that you get. So in a way, the self-interaction of the electron, if you want, uh, through the electromagnetic field. The electron interacts with itself. If you want to go to, through the perturbative uh, Feynman diagram kind of approach to these processes. Fadeyev says, OK, look, what, what happens if you actually consider, instead of an interaction picture based on we have the, the, the free states at minus infinity and the free states at plus infinity. If we consider the self-interaction uh, in a non-perturbative way, which is the important thing, and you have actually, it's, it's kind of funny because you get something that uh, is a structure that is a little, a, a very ill. The, 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 you get something like not separable in the space. But anyway, forget about that, like I said. Uh, you, you get horrible <laughs> things, but uh, he, he actually shows that if you handle those properly, there is no IR divergences. Also, there is no calculations to make because it's, it's horrible. <laughs> but <laughs> but, but, but uh, it's not where the origin of the problem is. The origin of the problem is that we are assuming that we have scattering states in the far past and scattering states measured in the far future. 
And that is what if you're introducing by a false assumption that you have asymptotic freedom in terms of asymptotic, not in terms of coupling strength, but in yeah. time, yeah. the asumption that you have asymptotic freedom is the wrong assumption that introduces when you do your perturbation theory, the higher divergences, and the tricks that we know about removing those higher divergences are just um, uh, uh, kind of like effective ways that ambiguously, non -amb actually like ambiguously, uh, uh, remove and give you a correction. So that correction, that number of the correction, we should ignore. Uh, the point is, I guess, that the, the dependence on the scale is weak, it's logarithmic. Therefore, we don't care as much. We actually don't see it in experiments, so we don't care as much. But there is a formal problem with particle physics S. Uh, particle physicists know that. Um, uh, well, not good particle physicists know that. Uh, 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 the problem is with scattering theory and the S matrix and the perturbative approach. You see, there's many things conspiring. The notion of particle as in like particles far away don't see each other. Particles close to each other, they don't see each other again, combined with a perturbative approach. These two things together give you the higher divergences. And it's an open problem in that sense. It's there and it's a problem, even though it's ignored because we can do experiments and calculations and we don't have enough sensitivity to soft photons in high energy experiments to actually care. Yeah. And because the dependence is logarithmic. I hope that that answers yeah. it. Yeah. 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 So let's elicit some class participation. I've got a short screen, but if you have questions or comments, that's no, great. Uh, put your hand up. Um, okay, Chris. Yes, yeah, so this is very much along the lines of what you were just discussing. So if the question had been formulated as, what are the different types of divergences in quantum field theory, and to what extent can we identify the source of those as, in the case of perturbative frameworks, the improper use of distributional objects? So it seems like we've got a very interesting case, and you're drawing on you know, historical material here to, to explain that aspect. But for the other divergences, so Eduardo was just talking about infrared divergences, are the other kinds of non-perturbative divergences in QFT still an open book? Are there similar kinds of historical lines of thought or even contemporary lines of thought that would clarify those? And this is you know, just opening up the discussion, a bit. It's, so I'd like to hear if you might not have thought about those. These might not be things that the work you've done addresses directly, but I'd be curious to hear more. I mean, who wants to go? I have opinions, but I've already monopolized a lot. No, no, no. no. I mean, I, 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 it would be helpful to me if you said more about the point you raised about the um, non-perturbative UV right. divergences. Because as, as I said, I think my story is really, it's intended to be restricted to right. the right. perturbative case. And so maybe you can say okay. a bit more about the non-perturbative UV stuff. Right. So uh, try, I'll try to be brief. Um, I'll try. The, um, the, uh, there are, there are uh, such things as uh, non-perturbative UV divergences. Uh, I know little about the nature of those divergences. I know phenomena where it happens. I am, uh, I am not sure if actually consider uh, the, like it's a problem of uh, 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 not considering in a right way the distributional nature. I know examples of UV divergences non-perturbative that are solved when you handle distributionally things right. But that doesn't mean that all of them are right. cured right. by that. Yeah. I know examples. Um, the, um, uh, there's one, one case that is uh, actually related to the Schwinger effect. The non what the Schwinger effect is. Sorry, I was going to ask okay. this earlier. So the Schwinger effect is the, if you want, let me demonstrate it like that. The excitation of the fermion, the, of, a, of a charge field because of a very intense static uh, electric field. Uh, not to confuse with vacuum polarization. Vacuum polarization is dynamical, and vacuum polarization is perturbative. Vacuum polarization is, uh, it's often, it's, uh, it's often you hear the two things as the same. Vacuum polarization is, I have a dynamical, a strong variation of the of, of, uh, electromagnetic field, say, and that uh, starts creating electrons and positrons, and that's perturbative. And because it's perturbative, I can afford myself to call electrons and positrons, you know, that's the thing. The other one, the Schwinger effect, is different. If you have a very strong static uh, field, and that very strong static field uh, excites the charge field. Um, in the Schwinger effect, uh, it is known that there are divergences, but it's also known the kind of divergences that there are and how, to, how you can ignore them. And in particle physics, people are very aware of this. People say, oh, the origin of these divergences is, again, similar to the origin of the, uh, the IR divergence that I mentioned. It's because we work with uh, free states not the bare states, not the, not the dress states that you would have because you have an interacting theory always. 
if you actually consider the interacting theory always, the Schringer effect, so the corrections to the, to the ground state of the theory will already be there and we wouldn't have those divergences. So basically, um, in the dressing process of the fields, they say it's already included, so we don't care much about it. So you see, I know that there are such phenomena, that is, UV divergent even non-perturbatively. I also know that some of the phenomena that is divergent non-perturbatively is related to the obsession to do point-like uh, quantum field theory, as in giving value to excitations of the field at a given point in space. Uh, if you actually relax that and have distributions, uh, and you have like uh, excitations that are like uh, uh, nice, by that I mean nice distributions, as in smooth enough distributions, um, so then you get um, that those divergences disappear completely. I know that for a fact. For example, this is what happens with extremely fast interactions, extremely short interactions in quantum field here. So imagine that you have a free theory, and then you make it interact with another theory, uh, uh, with another field, say two fields interacting, but they interact with a kink, like very fast, very quick, in the limit of a delta kind of interaction. Uh, if you do that, uh, you get divergences, TV divergences, and those TV divergences are related with the fact that you have a point kind of point by point interaction. If you actually smear the interaction, uh, the, those divergences disappear completely. And basically the UV, so again, how much of the UV you see, so the problem, the way I see it is, you see, if you see too much of the UV, you're gonna get divergences. In physical processes, you don't get to see too much of the UV. You only get to see the UV a lot if you are relocalizing time and space. When you delocalize in space in a smooth kind of way, or in time, but in space in particular, in this case, you are suppressing the UV, by something like the Fourier transform, kind of a Fourier transform, yeah, uh, of, the, of the smearing that you have in your observables. And then therefore, the UV, that is the problematic thing that diverges, is cut off by this particular, and not cut off by an artificial cutoff that you put in, right. but more a physical soft cutoff that is related with the space-time uh, duration, extension of your process that you're considering. And so that's as much as I can tell, I guess. About do other of you want to respond to Chris? I mean, Landau Land holds it. Yeah, oh, that's why I was going to fall in this category too. And it's a different, mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. the conceptual status of these things is, is yeah. once again distinct. And, um, I mean, like, large order divergences also seem bad, uh, but that's. Uh, yeah, I mean, then there's a whole story <laughs> about, yeah. and you've heard my story about resummation um, methods and uh, uh, like, obstacles to doing so. Yeah. To what extent? You know, as I mentioned, um, you know, if you add up the first few terms, you get a good answer. You get the best answer we've ever got for any physical quantity ever, right? But we know that um, eventually you won't get the right answer. You get an infinitely wrong answer, in fact. Um, and that's to do with the fact that um, this is an asymptotic series. Asymptotic to what? We don't know. Um, prob probably not a unique thing because there are these exponentially small effects that are just invisible to perturbation theory and so there's just an, inf an infinite collection of ambiguities coming from 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 now a totally different source than the than the ambiguity <coughs> in the distributional character of the quantities in question um, and yeah I, I'm, I'm trying I, I think that ex that exhausts my yeah, no, my yeah. classification. So the, 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 about those uh, divergences, yeah. the ones that you get in perturbation theory if you sum too many, at least we know. So it's, it's a problem in perturbation theory. Perturbation theory will never capture things that come from, like, uh, as you said, exponentially suppressed, like exponential of one over the coupling strength, basically. Mm -hmm. But that's nice because you know then to what order, more or less you can estimate to what order you need to sum before you go start going crazy, which is uh, don't go further than one over the coupling in terms of order. Landau poles are way more problematic. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, they're real bad. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> There's one in the standard model. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, I'm not sure what more, the, I mean, I can uh, like sketch out various Hail Mary stories that people tell, which is, uh, you know, I mean, you, the convincing evidence for these uh, often comes from perturbation theory or some combination of perturbation theory and like a uh, kind of, you know, like lattice analysis uh, for non perturbative uh, analysis of like some local sector of the theory. So like you can do, uh, you know, you can do like a lattice analysis of uh, five four theory, for example, and you get evidence, but it's not like a non perturbative proof um, of the existence of a Landau pole, mm -hmm. uh, even in five four and four dimensions. Um, yeah, I mean the Hail one Hail response is just to say like, oh, uh, 
you know, we're doing perturbative calculations of the beta function, so the couplings get really big long before they blow up, uh, but the couplings are big enough that we're out of the re regime of perturbative validity, uh, mm -hmm. like, you know, um, and then there's a kind of maybe a miracle happens, yeah. like you sort of make a thing with your hands, <clears throat> that's, uh, that's you don't what, want to say it out loud. That's what Gelman and Lowe say, uh, and, are, and also Bugloboff and Chirkov as well. They're kind of on the side of essentially uh, let's not panic about QED being inconsistent. Yeah. Um, um, well, also there's some... Whereas Landau was kind of like... Well, yeah. Landau like, wanted <laughs> field theory to die. Yeah. Uh, but as I, yeah, as I recall from the Goblin Low paper, they, part of what they're investigating is whether it hits a fixed point. Um, and they say, um, they say, well, like it's, it doesn't hit a perturbative fixed point, but like maybe it hits... They uh, distinguish different scenarios. Yeah. They give an argument that it has to be like monotonically increasing yeah, as you yeah. go to higher and higher energies. And yeah. then they say, either this is going to diverge or converge to some finite value. Um, and then they say, we can't really tell this from perturbation theory. Yeah, that's right. Then maybe you hit some fixed point. Uh, like, it's a sort of proto-asymptotic safety scenario yeah. um, where you can't, it's a fixed point where you can't do perturbation theory around it. Um, but yeah. like maybe it gets there. We just can't find it out with a perturbative calculation of the beta function. Um, yeah, those... Uh, I don't really know the state of the art in, like, how people have progressed beyond that, though. Like, no, like, non I, I, mean, I, I don't know what calculations the state in QED. Of non perturbative uh, triviality proofs are. As far as I know, um, we know, like, there are proofs that uh, you can construct phi 4 in dimensions lower than 4, uh, proofs that you can't in dimensions higher, and 4 just sits there obnoxiously. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know. Uh, if QED is even, uh, I don't know what the status of QED, the analogous status of QED is. Mm -hmm. It's an argument I've heard um, about the uh, irrelevance of Landau poles in the sense of uh, the energy scales of which, uh, in the QED one anyways, the energy scales of which that's relevant, it makes no sense. You need to consider gravity, gravitational back reaction, mm -hmm. and therefore doesn't even make sense until right. we have a theory that encompasses everything. Because I mean, yeah, it's like electro electroweak unification happens. Uh, right, right, something right. like you know, e to the 280 or magnitude is lower yeah. than uh, the Landau pole, yeah. Um, so yeah, like, I mean, the, the QED becomes, in a, I mean, all of these theories become effective long before you, like on yeah, physical right. grounds, long before you hit the actual Landau pole. But if you wanted to say, like, I need an argument on purely mathematical grounds that uh, mm -hmm. this thing has to be an effective field theory. It does seem like Landau poles are more compelling than just UV divergences in a series right. expansion. Right? Mm -hmm. Doreen is in the queue. Do you want to be in the queue? So I have a, I guess, kind of historical practical question about the standard story and where it comes from. And so one of the things that came up near the beginning of Porter's talk was um, the quotes from Feynman, which yeah. nicely captured the view. And so I think one aspect of the view is that Feynman gets an outsized role in the story about the history of quantum mm -hmm. theory. And part of that is then being overshadowed all these other things that are happening that people are, it, historically speaking, are kind of ignored. So I wondered if um, you wanted to say something about why you thought the standard story became the standard story, and I'm curious about whether Feynman has a role in this or not. I mean, probably. Uh, Feynman is outspoken and charismatic. Um, Dirac, too. Yeah, I was, was going to say, say Dirac, so like one who Dirac, gets Heisenberg, like various big names are not terribly happy about their normalization procedure like later into their careers. Um, and yeah, I mean, that's like they, at least sort of looking back and you're reading, you know, like you're going through like Inspire or whatever, and you're looking at papers that people published. Uh, and it's like, well, okay, there's a, you know, collection of um, like, you know, Far flung, far flung uh, people in far flung universities, names I never heard, or like there's Dirac giving a uh, like a sort of you know influential symposium speech. Which one of these things am I gonna take seriously and read? And I think for many years there's just like like those are names you know, they're influential people, and so it's kind of like a, it's a bad psychological tendency, but it's a natural human psychological tendency to just kind of be like oh like this must have been influential. These were you know like everybody knew who they were. They were real smart. Um, so that's probably part of it, I guess. But that's psychoanalysis. It's not uh, like a justified story of historiography. So I'm just curious about like the textbook tradition. Like if you look at the Orkin and Drow or hmm. some of the earlier textbooks, or maybe the Soviet textbooks are different as well. I mean, I, that'd be an interesting way to see. I mean, uh, uh, what people were, you know, what people were getting in their graduate QFT courses. 
long after if, like effective field theory methods started to become pretty pronounced in the like in the theory community, um, they didn't make their way into textbooks for a long time. Um, they, I mean, they're like there are you know sort of nice sets of lecture notes. Like I think that. Uh, I mean, so Paul Chinsky, when he writes those Tazi lecture notes, the effective field theory and the Fermi surface notes in like 92, he says something in the introduction to the effect of like, like all the, I mean, effectively like all the grown-ups uh, are doing this and like nobody's telling the kids about it. Yeah. Uh, and like this is, this is bad pedagogy and bad for the development of the field, which is part of why he gives these lectures. Um, and that's 92. I don't know when it becomes entrenched in textbook pedagogy. When, uh, I mean, it's pretty, like, so I think Shrednick, he's, like, 2007, and he has a bit about effective field theory, but it's not, like, a, so that's not the sort of animating character of the, the book. Yeah. Um, but that's, that's a, yeah, that's a good question. Hmm. I know that some of the early, I can't remember which one or two it is, but there are some of the field theory textbooks from the 50s. Uh, yeah, there there is sort of... Uh, trepidation expressed about um, certain normalization calculations. Um, but like that's as helpful as I can be right now. I don't remember which books or what exactly they say. Yeah, I was going to say, um, I think maybe part of the, the reason for the perception of there being this kind of gap of 20 years before renormalization makes sense is because it is due to the fact that, I mean, the figures that we were talking about who were making some kind of progress in understanding renormalization or like reinterpreting it were all pretty marginal figures really. Um, and yeah, like, yeah, we were, we've been finding this in our, uh, research, well, the stuff you were talking about, about, um, how distribution theory filtered into QFT. It seems like there were various people kind of fairly marginal figures who weren't really talking to each other all making this statement, but there wasn't a kind of, um, concerted effort to really deal with these issues. And probably part of the reason for that is that um, confidence in quantum field theory is supposed to have been low in this period. And also yeah. people were, people wanted to get away from perturbation theory because they wanted to tackle um, the, the, strong, strong the strong interaction. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a critical yeah. part of this story is that by, by the 60s, I mean, Trick Porter gave a picture of Schwinger who's really the only figure who's really remaining committed to like field, or one of the very few figures who's remained committed to field theory in that um, period where everybody else is pretty hesitant about whether or not field theory is up to the job of actually treating the strong interactions. And so there does go by a period, like a decade, where <laughs> people are scratching around for different approaches. Um, and I think, that must play into the way that this story got propagated in some right. sense. I, exactly how, I don't have the right way to say just yet, but I, yeah. I, I think that's right. I mean, also, I think part of the, like reading stuff that people in particle physics remember about that period is that, I mean, Wilson, so I mean, yeah, people, uh, I mean, Wilson didn't come out of nowhere, but uh, I mean, a lot of the Wilson stuff is happening in the condensed matter community, um, which at that time, uh, particle physicists like, are not paying attention to at all. Um, there's a funny, I mean, Weinberg, there's a funny description of how he learned about uh, like the Wilsonian RG picture, um, which is that they asked him to give some Eric Day summer school lectures and he decided to learn about, uh, to teach critical phenomena so he could learn about it in like 76, which is when he reads the Wilson stuff. Um, it's in this critical phenomena for field theorists, uh, like set of notes. Um, so like, I mean, in that point, like it's a big deal. Uh, and Wilson, and, but Weinberg still is kind of like, ah, like I think that's like, he's doing stuff with the icing model. I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, um, so I think that's also part of it is like the, um, the communities were really quite divided at that point. Um, it's just, you know, yeah. I guess another thing you mentioned is um, so the Schwinger and the Jewish and Wilson's publishing hardly anything, and uh, then there's a lot of stuff that's written in Japanese. That's so th there's also those factors that are playing into the translation of the No, I think that's right, yeah. Um. So, talking about every divergence and the people of the to like bring up this notion of these 
compatible user being PFTs and stack like because the first time I learned reading optimization was in stack like not not in mm. PFTs. But but there the UV divergences have like an ontological reason because of the lattice mm. spacing. Um, and uh, so there's this notion of the discreteness in the theory there which doesn't necessarily have an analog in PFTs. So I was wanting to open that question up about like the discrete versus continuous kind of a debate uh, in, in the realm of PFTs because like there's one of Wallace's uh, criticisms for APFT is essentially uh, that the, the axioms are true for 10 power minus 43 meters or 10 power minus 43 power minus, like, it could be arbitrarily uh, small. So there's no notion of that space there. Um, so I was wondering what your thoughts were about like, this tension there. Who wants to embody the ghost of Julian Schwinger? <laughs> <laughs> I need better hair. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, you're right that like you don't have a natural uh, like a lattice, uh, you know, like angstrom length lattice or whatever in field theory in the way you do uh, in a condensed matter system. Um, but I mean, I, what do I say? I mean, it seems to me uh, like very primitive. I mean, I think the appropriate thing to say is that like we just don't have a very good understanding of what's happening at very short distances. Um, and like that's also true in field theory, although like we don't have a concrete physical picture of like the, what, where a lattice structure would arise, uh, but we do have a fairly um, like fairly good evidence suggesting that um, field theory is going to break down somewhere uh, around the scale where gravitational effects become significant. Um, I'm not sure what more to say, I guess. Uh, I'm attempting to just sidestep the Wallace thing. Uh, so, so, so um, I think you're right. The, um, the, there are two, two thoughts, I guess, I want to bring to, to this. One is um, that uh, the fact that there is not a distinct treatment of particular length scales or scales, let's say, with this core theory, uh, in in the in AQFT, doesn't I wouldn't say it's a criticism as in like uh, um, those scales uh, AQFT doesn't aspire to be a description of high energy physics in the sense of gravitationally high energy physics. So in that sense, it's kind of out of the realm. But also say one thing. Um, you can get well-defined QFTs, uh, effective QFTs, out of uh, considering the emergence of scales. So one example is uh, causal set theory, uh, Rafael Sorkin, right? Causal set theory uh, uh, can be, you can take a continuum limit, and you can take a, a, a continuum limit in which you get a field theory. And in particular, the way in which it modifies the, say, a scalar theory is by modifying the Wyman function. Modifying the Wyman function, with some spectral function and adding like massive field theories if you want. The Weinman function is some integral over some spectral density and then uh, massive field theory, right? So in that sense, I think that as an effective theory, now if we talk about gravity, right? Or quantum gravity or whatever it is that gravity really is, and or, or if you want all the, all the interactions between matter and gravity are, I think that still AQFT as an effective theory in those cases is really powerful. You can modify AQFT very easily to account for those. In a particular model of quantum gravity, I'm pretty sure that you can, and you should, I think, not only you can, but you should talk about the low energy limit and the intermediate effective limit in which you can still talk about a quantum field theory, but you get modifications of the quantum field theory. So I don't think it's bad, per se, right? It's just, it's not a question that is addressed uh, as a starting point in AQFT, but I think AQFT is still useful even in those cases. I, my, my take. We got a little over five minutes left and a couple of questions. So if we're efficient, we can get to them all. So you're next. Yeah. Um, so we've heard a statement that copying constants depend on energy scale, you know, length scale. Um, do you think that this is a good way to, to express it? Does this, does, this, does this express some underlying reality, or is it more a mere computational device? A story that doesn't really. 
it doesn't seem really make sense. Uh, I feel like this is my problem. <laughs> Sorry? Yeah, uh, I mean, no, I, I, like I think the story makes sense and is right. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the short version. Do you want to? <laughs> uh, <laughs> do you want to <laughs> say anything? I, I gave my spiel. I, I, I showed. I, I, maybe I'm not understanding the question. So what's okay. the, what's the? Um, can you say a bit more about why one might be skeptical about that well, story? You could maybe just choose an arbitrary energy scale for all your calculations, also other energy scales, and you just have to do more summations of all and perturbation theory. You have to sum up all the diagrams and all orders. In principle, you should still be able to do it correctly. So, like, if you're doing. Uh, yeah, I mean, there are functions to just sort of. You, you could say that they encode. Um, <coughs> No, 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 like, so if you're doing Dimrig and you pick the wrong, uh, renormalization scale, like the wrong scale, which to define the renormalized value you're coupling constants you're going to use, um, uh, yeah, you pick the wrong scale, then you get, like, a big, yeah, well, I think he's, the question is just, like, that's, uh, you can slide the scale around, uh, like in the gelman low version of the RG, or just yeah. what you do when you do Dimrig and you have a mass independent scheme, yeah. um, yeah, then you'll get, uh, like, big ratios of, like, the renormalization scale, um, and the scattering energy in your in the logarithms in the expansion, and that makes your uh, resummation of the diagrams a big pain. Uh, but the question is, like, should I can do? I'm allowed to do that. Yeah. Uh, it's a bad idea. Like, it makes my life harder. But I'm certainly allowed to do that. Right. Exactly. Um, and so the question is, like, what? Uh, good. So maybe this is a longer. Uh, I guess I'll just say this thing, and then we can talk later because uh, Noel has been very patient. I don't know. No, no, you cannot. Uh, <laughs> uh, um, yeah, the, uh, I mean, it's worth maybe distinguishing. Uh, yeah, uh, different. I mean, scheme dependence are two maybe more uh, seriously different notions than the normalization group. Um, where, uh, yeah, if you um, if you are treating uh, just like the choice of the normalization scale as like an arbitrary parameterization of uh, something like fully solved theory. Uh, it's like, oh, like which scale do I want to define the couplings? Uh, and like I can slide it up and down. I can put it wherever I want. Um, but then in the, there is a sense in which, uh, well, there's a sense in which your choice is arbitrary, uh, but it's still hard to understand. I mean, like the scaling behavior of the cross sections is certainly real. Uh, and that's <laughs> encoded in the way that the couplings scale. Um, and. Well, yeah, uh, you, I guess I'll just say you have less freedom to slide the, I mean, if you have a cutoff um, and you're actually integrating out degrees of freedom as you uh, change the scale, um, then of course, like you can't invert it in a way you can in a fully solved theory. It's, you can't just like slide the parameterization up and down in energy scales. Um, and so in that sense, like the picture of, uh, well, in both cases, uh, it's like the picture of packaging higher energy physics into the definition of the coupling at some lower energy scale, uh, I think is right. Uh, it's just much clearer when you like actually kick the higher energy physics, like the high energy, the high momentum states out of your Hilbert space uh, and bundle their contributions into the effective couplings. Um, then I think it's very like that's a very clear picture of like where the physics that you removed went back in. Uh, but I do I do think it's true in both cases. Yeah. Noel's been very patient, and this should be a speed round because we have like a minute and a half. Uh, okay. Um, I guess I want the new splash update on scaling algebras. You see lots of different historical approaches to renormalization, so how does scaling algebra stuff map onto that? Ask the formal people. <laughs> I, I don't know. I Do you know, Mike? <laughs> Rupert, I, um, uh, I'm, I'm afraid you're probably better equipped. Yeah, yeah I'm just this feels like a question we should probably ask you. you. Yeah, I don't know. That's <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I, 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 Beyond, um, I mean, there's a, there's a question that I have intended to get around to, which is how that program is connected up to some of these developments that I was talking about that incorporate the resources of causal perturbation theory. And I guess the, the short answer to your question is, unfortunately, that's that's something that that remains to for me to understand better. Um, uh, but I, I guess I, yeah, I don't, I don't want to say something.
It's easy to be speedy when you don't know anything. <laughs> <laughs>